How many of you have gotten in a fight online in the last year? Raise your hand. Yeah, this year's been a tough one for everyone. And since the election, we've seen this almost constant call to start hearing from one another, to start listening and healing and coming together. The big theme is always start listening. I don't know about you, but my online spaces still look something like this. Uh, there's lots of name calling, there's lots of yelling, and there's noticeably very little listening. And when I ask my friends how their listening is going, they usually respond with, poorly. So why does this go so poorly? If you ask ex experts, we've heard a lot over the years about how communication just isn't possible in digital spaces. We need tone of voice, we need body language, we need facial expressions, and yet we're actually communicating pretty well online. We're communicating across language, across time, across space. We're making up new languages with emojis. Like, communication is happening for better or worse. So why doesn't it work for listening? It turns out listening is really hard. We're just not that good at it in person either. How many of you have been telling a story you were really excited to tell and you're super engaged and all of a sudden the person you're telling it to just cuts you off? And you're like, man, they weren't listening to me at all, right? That's happened. And how many of you have cut your friend off because you weren't actually listening to what they were saying and you were waiting to talk? It turns out listening is just really hard. So instead of doing that hard work, we tend to take easy shortcuts. We tend to not really listen when people are talking to us. We tend to just sort of agree and go along with people even if we don't really agree with them. And we tend to not really ask meaningful questions. We ask how are you all the time and don't expect a real answer. So maybe the issue isn't our digital tools, but our bad habits. And in fact, these digital tools are built to please us. And so it makes sense that they actually took the conversations we really like to have, those conversations where we don't listen to each other, and they just put them online. So instead of listening to our friends, we just sort of scroll past and don't actually read everything and engage with it. We tend to throw away likes, even with new emotions that we can react with on Facebook. All of those are a shared, mutual reaction together. And instead of asking questions, our Facebook and our Twitter literally prompts us to share our thoughts at all times. It's always about putting ourselves at the center. So if we want to listen, we probably have to go back to the basics of listening. Our digital tools haven't created these challenges. They're just amplifying what we do. So what are the basics of listening? As a user experience designer, I've designed websites, apps, I've designed museum exhibits, I've designed conversations. And in the last few years, I've been focused on designing tools for high school students uh, and the people who support them. If you want to find a group who fundamentally feels like no one is hearing them, high school students is a really good place to start. <laughs> and so in my job, ideally, I would be able to have high school students in my office at all times critiquing my work working with me, collaborating, telling me about their life, but due to time and budget and the fact that they need to go to class and I need to have some semblance of self-esteem at the end of the day, we don't do it this way. Instead, I have had to become really good at listening. Um, and I do this because I need to be able to turn myself off when I'm in the office and turn on the high schoolers that I meet. I need to be able to embody them and make enough of a call about what I think they'd like so that when I do get to spend more time with them, I use that time wisely. So I want to talk about the basics of listening. And the first and most important thing you can do is get in the right mindset. Number one is committing to listening. I get to do this by scheduling an interview with a high school student. I know going into that that this interview is not about me. It's not about me sharing my thoughtful ideas. It is really about me hearing them. But I also do this in my everyday life. I've sort of made a commitment that every time I get into a taxi or an Uber or a Lyft, 
I try to engage my driver and really listen to their life because it's this opportunity where, you know, they're usually willing to talk. I found online, it sometimes actually helps for me to state this and sort of cut through that noise and say, hey, I actually really want to listen. Tell me something. I don't usually tell my drivers that because it's a little creepy. But knowing that you've come to this conversation committing to listening is the biggest step. The next is remembering it's not about winning. And this is the hardest thing for designers to do. We all come into this career because we are creative and energized and excited about these big ideas that we have that are going to change the world. And then you go and you show it to a high school student and they look at it and they go, it's basic. <laughs> and what I've had to learn is that fighting with a high school student about whether or not it's basic and trying to convince them that it's not is never going to work. Instead, I have to swallow my pride and double down on listening and commit to hearing, OK, why? What does basic mean? Tell me more. What are the things that you're looking for that excite you and drive you? How do I bring this to something that you actually want to use? Unfortunately, convincing and listening aren't things that happen in the same conversations. And if we're really committed to listening, you sort of have to give up on winning. And lastly is to remember it's probably not about you, so don't make it about you. Right now, even building something as innocuous as a platform to help students do their homework is something that gets wrapped up in all of these really hard conversations about inequality and racism in our schools, about immigrant parents, about financial insecurity. And what I've had to learn is that me going into these places, when a kid is willing to bring up this conversation with me, it's not my job to defend my own merits and my own credibility for being here and working on this problem. Instead, it's about listening to this student and hearing what they have to say, understanding how this impacts their lives. And so I think this is one of the things that's been really, really hard recently. And I know that my, my homework platform is never going to help with immigration in America. It's not going to solve that problem. But I can at least understand that kid and their fears and bring that idea into it so that I'm not triggering it in another way, so that I understand a little bit more that this is a full person. All right, so you're committed to listening. What do you listen to? There are lots of ways to get people talking. I threw together a couple that work really well for me. The first one, and this has literally made my job feasible, is reflecting what you're hearing. So what you do is a student tells you something or anyone tells you something interesting and you say, that's really interesting. What I heard you say was X, Y, Z. Is that correct? Can you clarify for me? And what this does is it lets that student control the narrative. It lets them verify that yes, you understood what they were saying or fix any misconceptions you got. Communication is really hard. And sometimes it lets them backtrack when they hear the words come out again and they're like, oh, maybe that wasn't right. One of the key things for this, though, is that you have to reflect it in your own words. Uh, you can't parrot it back to them because as we tell our kids, plagiarism is bad. It doesn't work. <laughs> Next, ask meaningful questions. Um, if you've had a conversation with a high schooler recently and tried to ask them a question that could be answered in yes or no, they will answer in yes or no. It won't really help you. One of the key things I always look for is I try to get them telling a story. For me, when they tell me a story about what's going on in their life, it's easier for me to get back into that mode and embody them. I'm able to remember it better. I'm able to bring it back to my counselor, to my colleagues, um, and I'm able to build a product specifically for them. How do I do this? I try to ask questions like, Tell me about the last time you were really excited to learn. What were you learning? What did that look like? Who was teaching you? It doesn't have to be in a classroom. It's sort of letting them grow and tell a story to you. This is one of the things I'm actually most excited about our digital spaces, is that it creates this opportunity for us to actually stop, breathe, and think about a meaningful question instead of in person when we're all just trying to feel a little smarter and hoping no one catches us that we don't know the next thing to say. And lastly, don't force it. 
There are high school kids that are just never gonna wanna talk to me, and that's fine. In this job, I've learned to handle rejection really, really well. What I've learned most is that as much as I can create a space to hear students, they have to want to share. And that is completely their choice. What I'm asking them for is something that they're giving away for free and engaging with, and some of them just don't want to, and that's completely okay. I think especially online, remembering that not everyone is listening, to, ready to be heard, and not everyone wants to be heard right now, and maybe there are some people you just shouldn't be trying to listen to because they're trying to antagonize you. Remembering that you shouldn't force it is important. Our digital tools reinforce our bad habits, but you can choose to make new ones. And it begs the question of why are we doing all this listening if it's so hard? I go home at the end of these days and I usually hide under my blankets for about five minutes and for five hours and refuse to talk to anyone. But what I've learned is that the media narrative around high schoolers, if I were to listen to that, I would believe that they were all these terrible, self-absorbed teenagers who are terrorizing America. And instead, what I've learned is that high schoolers are witty and funny and insightful and completely aware and authentic and generous and kind. And right now, they're the thing that's giving me the most hope about healing our country. And so I think it's worthwhile for us to stop and take a minute to work on our bad habits and work on listening more. Thank you.